in uh, Whiskey was we needed um, asynchronous endpoints, and we still do. Um, there's a couple of applications uh, that we, we want to enable, so if you want to know more about this, come, come ask me what these are. Um, it uh, uses standard open API specifications, so that's great for uh, interoperability. Um, and we can enable some really cool things using the open API spec and vice versa. So we can use the spec of other projects and generate some cool things for the Galaxy. Um, it's based on modern Python type, type pins, so it's using the Pedantic library, uh, which provides validation. So whenever a request comes in, we'll know exactly uh, whether you know that request is actually valid. It includes everything we need, uh, and it generate a nice exception message if it doesn't. Um, in the same way, outgoing requests are validated as well, uh, so that enables us to catch bugs before they even happen. Um, we can generate fantastic documentation from um, the pandemic models, and it's really a huge upgrade to the developer experience. I think this really makes a difference from getting it right on the third, fourth, or fifth try to getting it right on the first try. So, yeah, I mean, it's the end of uh, Whiskey Whiskey supporting Galaxy. Since 2201, uh, the default web server is Unicorn, um, and Whiskey could still be used. That's actually the situation uh, since 1909, I think. Um, well, you know, we, we got things production ready. Uh, in 2205, we have to drop support for Whiskey. So Galaxy will be exclusively an ace to i application driven by FastAPI. And uh, we've just recently learned that Whiskey has entered maintenance mode. So it's a good thing we started a year ago uh, preparing the switch. Actually, no. Um, the routes migration is still ongoing. Um, so we have a uh, whiskey middleware um, that, I mean, ASGI middleware that lets us call into uh, whiskey routes. Uh, and that was like super essential for us to, to start working on it and bring it into production. And these routes are, it's, it's not critical that they're not converted yet. What's important is that we have the tools to, uh, to create, create API routes currently. And a uh, cons consequence of this is uh, that Gravity replaces USB's modern on job handling. Um, so Nate already mentioned this in the Gravity um, updates. So that's tightly connected there. So the architectural choices we've made is that we went with the thin API layer uh, that is backed by the service layer. So what that means is most of the uh, Python code that's run in the API is actually just a single line. Uh, it takes in uh, all the parameters um, and it returns models. So it's like super simple. Should one day we have to change to another framework, it will be super easy. Uh, the service layer implements API specific logic. So that means like working with, with limits, with uh, API keys, uh, decoding, um, encoded IDs, um, so that the managers in the end can really deal with business logic, which for us mostly means, um, yeah, talking to the to the database, talking to uh, the task queue, uh, talking to storage. Um, Something that's new is where we're using the media type headers uh, in order to provide sort of new uh, responses to existing uh, API routes. So uh, that's one way to version responses. And it also allows generating clients that will know what type of response they're getting based on the data that they're sending in. Um, so that's really great for augmenting uh, endpoints and keeping backwards compatibility. Because uh, we don't know who's using our API. Um, that's the point of having an API it should be stable. And that enables us to have a stable API, but to introduce new features. So we have uh, 187 routes uh, converted with uh, nice documentation. Uh, 330 routes are still undocumented. That's an overestimate because of the way that uh, we have some sort of magic routes that just take an entity and do something to it, but it's just a single line of code. Um, yeah, I mean, here's an example of how you can actually interact with the API documentation. So people can use Galaxy or uh, slash API slash docs. Um, you can follow this and you can start interacting uh, interactively with the API. Um, so here, I've just, yeah, um, ask for a list of workflows. Um, 
And you know, there's, there's this little thing that lets you select things. You can try it out. It auto generates um, a curl command, so you can just take it and stick it into your bash script if, if you need to. So yeah, the pedantic models and the yeah, API specs, they nicely uh, capture uh, the required inputs and outputs. We can generate server stops and uh, John on this for the GA for JHTRS. Uh, the models are great for primary exchange and non-REST APIs. So um, the models are also being used for uh, separate tasks. We've got invalid or ignore client parameters, which is also great. Um, and it really also highlighted the inconsistencies we have in the API. But that's that's sort of the next step. Uh, we're never going to do, I don't know, probably not going to do a, a, a V2 API, but we can sort of solidify uh, the experience. Um, yeah, I mean, certain things in deployment are a little bit more complicated, but it's it's not a big deal, and we'll, we'll smooth this out. Um, and yeah, probably something else we learned that project stability is really important. Uh, Fast API is probably the best option for us today, um, but the way we architect everything, um, should this not be too many more, it would be easy for us to change from a large admin or user impact. So what's next? We want to get more API routes. Um, we're migrating to SQL Alchemy 2.0, which will allow us to talk asynchronously to the database. Um, we're going to do web sockets and uh, sort of some events in order to increase reactivity and decrease the amount of polling we do, um, in, especially in, in the history. And uh, yeah, we're going to create the API clients automatically. So this is, uh, you can just import an NPM package and, and start getting your alternative um, GUI for, for Galaxy. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. And, uh, yeah. Just compliment if there are more questions. I think next up we have Nicola and Marcus. Nicola and Michael. Thank you. So I'm Nicola Soranzo. I work in the Alam Institute in Norwich, and together with me is Michael Cruzo, and he's a Senegal project leader, and, and also from FCM, uh, Netherlands, and Germany. So together we're going to talk to you about the support for the common worker language in Galaxy. It's a collective work, and this slides also uh, with some of the work from, uh, from Marcus. And here we see the rest of people in data knowledge. So uh, if you have uh, downloaded one uh, uh, workflow from your Galaxy instance of choice, or if you have downloaded it from I don't know, one of the workflow repositories that are around, you will get the Galaxy native uh, format or .ga as for the extension that you get when you download it. And this format is um, JSON based, and it's never been supposed to be uh, something to share basically in, in the sense that to share it as be reusable and editable by a human. And in fact, it contains other JSON inside of JSON, and it's basically a representation of the state of the workflow in the database. It doesn't have a formal schema, so it's been updated during the course of the year without changing a, a, the schema version of it, of it because there's no schema. And the main issue with it is actually uh, coming out right now when uh, we are starting to have community uh, of uh, workflow developers that are being joined together like the IWC uh, to develop uh, best practice workflows. And when you have this kind of best practice workflow, you want to uh, version it to have new version that come out and they update tools or to add new steps. And if you want to diff this format, so to, to compare different version of your workflows, this doesn't work very well, so it's unbeatable. So one thing that uh, we have tried is also to change to a new workflow language instead of Galaxy. This work from, uh, from John Chilton mainly, and this is uh, YAML based, so it's much more more readable and writable than the GA format, and it's heavily modeled uh, on CWL. In fact, it has a schema that's also similar to CWL, that's linked here in the slide. And 
but and with by not currently exposing it to the, to the user interface, it's only available to the API. Uh, this plan, we plan to change soon to be uh, become the default export format. That we have an issue on the, on the repository to track this. And as an example of the slide. So why, since we already have a CWL-like format, why do we want to support actually a, a proper workflow standard? So the main reason is that we want to expand our community of workflow developers, and using CWL would allow us uh, to reach to uh, other uh, groups of workflow developers that are not even uh, yeah, it's already used uh, in uh, biology or bioinformatics. It's also used outside of our community, usual communities. And also, this will increase collaboration with other domain scientists and human work promoters that are not used to the Galaxy formats. And again, this will allow exchange of workflow across platforms. You could develop your workflow in, in Galaxy through the user interface, give it to someone who is a different platform, they would be able to directly run it, or vice versa. Anyway, standards are great, so we all love standards, right? <laughs> Uh, so why we choose the CWL in particular across the various uh, I don't know, hundreds of different workflow standards? So first of all, it has a, a very good documentation, starting from uh, how we have an introduction to it and the scheme is well documented as well. And it has hundreds and uh, hundreds of conformance that allow you to see if your implementation of the standards uh, is good enough to, to be comprehensive. And, uh, and allow, allow you to test your implementation. And it's a established pro uh, process to uh, get to a different uh, new version of the standard that we simply didn't have as explained before. And more important point also the execution model of CWL. So how tool and workflow are represented is similar enough that we can easily support or we can support it with integrating with the current uh, Galaxy workflow tools. So I'll give it the stage to Michael to introduce that we are. Welcome everybody. Yeah, so just a little bit about the CWL project. Uh, the CWL project is like a boutique, you know, small standards development organization hosted at the Software Freedom Conservancy, a uh, public charity based here in the US, who's legally obligated to work in the public interest. And as a project, we care about uh, the pre standards process, bringing people together to have a neutral, convenient place, making the standards, so actually writing it, uh, the editing, uh, following these open standard principles, and the post standards life cycle uh, about promoting uh, the standard, collecting you know, things that need to get fixed, and of course, supporting the, the open source tool ecosystem around it. Um, a little timeline, in case you're not familiar, we just celebrated our eighth birthday. We were born at the Biomax Open Source Conference, CodeFest. Uh, John Tilton is uh, one of my co-founders, along with myself, Peter Amstutz, uh, Boisha Janik. Uh, and then over the years, we've made steady progress and adoption. Um, and this, this year, the big news is uh, that we got a paper published in Communications of the ACM, really kind of bringing CWL to even a wider audience. That's kind of a nice journal that's called Mixed Industry and Academia. Uh, and work continues on further uh, documenting lots of corner cases and places where portability wouldn't happen with new conformance tests to ensure that, that the additional portability. So as we mentioned that the C CWL standards are two, um, or, or we did mention that actually there are two standards in one. One is the command line tool, which is actually the very difficult part part we are the most different from Galaxy, um, and then the workflow language, which is now with GX format two, and even the old Galaxy format, conceptually very similar. I think we're converging quite well. Um, we mentioned these, that we deliver the schema, the specs, the test suite. We support a very similar execution model um, that uh, benefits from software containers, but does not require them. Uh, in fact, some people run their stable workflows with uh, combo packages. And we've seen now adoption. Um, while we started bioinformatics in many fields, most recently the geospatial Earth observation folks um, are folding CDL into their open geospatial consortium standards. Um, so uh, maybe one day we get to add the Galaxy to this slide. But outside of Galaxy, CDL, uh, you can write it on your laptop and run it on your cluster and cloud. Uh, 
any sort of backend, you probably can imagine there's an open source implementation. And often there are commercially supported implementations as well. So as an update on the other side, just to show you a case of the syntax, here is a command line tool description on the right uh, in, the, in the YAML format. We do try to get that balance between human readable and machine readable. Um, and it's a very explicit model. And also very much informed by the experiences of, of the Galaxy community. Um, and we also support extensions uh, if needed. Um, so we mentioned that uh, 1.2 came out, there are conditionals now, which is I know something that Galaxy is looking at. And we just had a proposal come out for loops. So as an extension first, and maybe that will make it into Seville 1.3. So at the co-fest, maybe we'll look at the loop proposal to see how that might make sense for Galaxy. To me, uh, so how did, did we start the work and what's the current state of, of the CWM implementation in Galaxy? So the work started in 2015, again, when uh, basically the CWL uh, standard was being developed by John. And in, in that work, we were basically uh, supporting both the CWL tool standard and the workflow standard. For the tools, we are uh, subclassing the regular Galaxy tool class and creating to create to support the CWL tools and loading the implementation of using CWL tool, which is uh, a part of the reference implementation of CWL. And after reading it, the, the actual execution is very similar to the one of uh, normal Galaxy tools. For, uh, for workflow, we, we don't need CWL tool, but we are uh, reading it directly with the files and supporting it as a core uh, part of Galaxy. And from the technical point of view, we have a separate fork and branch that we uh, have developed across the, the number of years. And slowly, piece by piece, we, we've been integrating features upstream already. And when we try to do that using small pieces of code that are usable in itself to, to Galaxy or are cleaning up with existing interfaces. So what do we have uh, accomplished till now? So there's been a, a a huge number of pull requests that have been already merged, probably now around 100, and that are related to the CWL, not only specific to CWL. But the uh, main three things uh, that uh, we have been uh, putting in this slide is sub workflows. So if you don't know, the sub workflow in Galaxy uh, they came originally from the idea from CWL branch. And also expression tools, so tools that don't produce uh, a data set as an output, but something like a string or a number. And then this can now be used also to, to help in the implementation of conditionals. Uh, after this very nice initial implementation, uh, we have continued this work uh, through several bio hackathons. Uh, these are uh, being supported by, by LDC here in, in Europe. And uh, so we have already done four uh, projects, so in four different bio hackathons from 2018 to 2021. Uh, and the goal there was again, Taking small pieces out of the of the branch and open pull requests and merge them, and so in this way we have greatly reduced the, the size of this uh, uh, separate fork. And importantly, we are going to have a fifth one again in uh, in Paris in November uh, for the next value uh, hackathon Europe. So I've got here a list of implemented features. I'm going through them. It's quite boring, but again we have. Uh, the important one, like some workflows, have been now merged, and some of these are still only in the form. The partial Docker support, multi input scattering, uh, overriding two input defaults, uh, all these kind of things. And what's the current state of them? So, at the last bio hackathon, we opened a, an official pull request from the uh, separate fork, and this link it here, so it's 2009, and this is frequently replaced by myself or others in the group. To be always uh, to solve merge conflicts that normally happens, it's quite a lot of work just to keep, to keep it to be based and, uh, and working. And it, it's being reduced a lot, but it still touch around 100 files and adding or modifying 3,000 lines of code. So it's not huge, but it's not so much more. And regarding the conformance test, so how well we are implemented the CWL standard. So for 1.2, so the latest version of, of the standard. We have uh, over 200 tests that are passing and around 100 that are failing. But all of these uh, 100 that are failing, only 12 are actually the required core features of uh, CWL. 
the rest are all sharp features. And that's came in exactly today. So we have an external user from the University of Manchester, uh, Oliver, and then a couple of other people mentioned at the bottom of the slide. And they were able to take their own already existing CWR workflows and uh, loading them together with uh, their respective tools and uh, loading the user interface and running that. So it's quite uh, uh, exciting for us. Uh, the remaining challenges will. I think the main point here is that when you import a workflow, you can also have an embedded uh, tool. And this is basically what was mentioned already, I think, by Anthony yesterday. So, a very user defined tools. And this is kind of tricky, I think, because uh, in fact, we are actually only allowing it for admins at the moment. But we already have seen that for interactive tools, not to use the fact that interactive tools, uh, there's been people that have been abusing uh, the main Galaxy servers, uh, EU and others, running crypto mining. So if we do something similar for workflows, allowing use the factors, there's obviously a security uh, side that we need to take into account. So running uh, the tools the containers and staging with full SARS or limiting the access to the file system as much as we can. And there's also, we, we are reading resource requirements that can be specified by tools and workflows. So I can say, I need this amount of memory or this number of cores, etc. But we are not passing this information to run up what is, to run up what is. And also there's a strange, uh, for us, concept of default files and directories uh, that we don't have in Galaxy because everything in this Galaxy is a data set. And this is that these files that come together with the workflow. And finally, work for conditional implementation is not finalized. It's a work in progress. So, what's the road to the uh, to getting this CWL implementation on the Galaxy service and the public ones that everyone used? So, we first need to iron out the last uh, to offer required conformance test. And we plan to merge then this CWL branch uh, by the end of the year, I would say, probably uh, after the hackathon, maybe. And then we'll have to try to enable this uh, and on test Galaxy Project.org and see how people start collaborating on CWL workflows in Galaxy. Right? And just uh, if you're interested in collaborating and participating in the CWL community, I've put in, the, in here a couple of links to uh, the website, the, the official uh, Get Me Started guide, and our forum chats and website and GitHub repository. Uh, finally, acknowledgements. Uh, big thanks, of course, to, to John who started all this work and Marius that's leading it now together with us. Michael for being on stage with me today and all the other people listening the, uh, the slide. Uh, the various stages helping the implementation. And then if it's here, uh, uh, Bio Hackathon supporting us during the last four hackathons and five minutes. Uh, thank you all for attention. And uh, if there's some micro questions, uh, we'll be happy. Hi, uh, welcome. So this is a part of the Galaxy Architecture slides, which are um, three and a half hours long and, and highly technical. So we'll just sleep for the next uh, seven minutes. Um, so um, here's a a, a typical interaction between the, the, the web browser and, and, and Galaxy, uh, but I'll just sort of zoom into this part at the end. Um, the, uh, the, the web browser is going to make a request, and, and Galaxy backend needs to respond and, and, and produce some, some JSON typically. Um, and this, this is happening in a web request and should generally just take a couple seconds. But there's so much stuff that we want to do in Galaxy that takes more than a couple seconds installing tools, generating PDFs, creating data sets. Exporting histories, etc., um, and web servers just are not um, designed to do this work. Um, and this model breaks down a lot. And so, traditionally, in Galaxy, we've had all sorts of hacks over the years to deal with this. Um, but we're over the last couple of years really we're sort of converging on Celery 
and message queues is the way to deal with this. And it's a very sort of modern Python approach. And the idea here is that um, the, the, the web request, that initial web request from the API, just um, put the message in the message queue and says, here's some work to do. And then salary workers on the back end take that and, and then do the work. And then they, they have as long as they need. And, and this is how it should technically work or should typically work sort of current best practices in the field. Um, and this is sort of a, a very standard Python stack and much better than our sort of uh, typical hacks um, inside the Galaxy, um, which we're all sort of very ad hoc. There's some downsides of using salary. Um, anytime you have another piece of infrastructure um, in the stack, it's a little bit harder for admins. It's a little bit harder to configure Galaxy. Um, it's a little bit harder for developers to, to, to develop in this Galaxy. But uh, a lot of that was ameliorated by uh, Nate's amazing gravity work, uh, which he presented yesterday. But it starts up salary and it, it, it takes care of the details, hopefully for you, to at least make that initial user experience, or initial developer admin experience better, just starting Galaxy and having it all work. When you start Galaxy now, you'll see a list of salary tasks. And, and we really expanded the number of tasks we're, we're doing, the amount of work we're doing in salary over the last year. And it's really been essential to a lot of the things that we've seen. Um, and I'll get to that at the end of the slides here. Uh, but first, I'll just talk a little bit. This is from the architecture slide. So I'll talk a little bit about how to define a task, sort of developer um, idea. Um, a simple task looks a lot like a fast API endpoint that Marius talked about earlier. You've got a decorator that says, you know, it's, it's, it's a decorator on a function that says that this is a task instead of in fast API, let's say this is a controller method. And then you've got, you know, the requests as parameters to the function, as well as the components that get injected automatically based on type. And then you've got, you know, you just do your small piece of work. And, and so everything that Marius said about, uh, you know, protecting ourselves uh, from fast API and fast changes and having thin controllers applies to our tasks also. And the developer experience should feel very similar. Um, yeah, so the, the, the request here is coming in as um, the, the setup export job thing. Um, it's, a, it's a pydantic model, just like with fast API. We've done the plumbing to make sure that Celery knows how to take those and, and send them to the um, task. Um, and and the, the models are really quite simple. They're just Python classes with, with type properties. Let's get over the implementation details. But the components, like here, the model store manager, that just gets injected from the Galaxy app object based on the type of the thing it is. Executing the task from inside of Galaxy, sort of the client side of this, is pretty simple. You just build one of those request objects, um, and then you sort of take the decorated function and call the delay method on it. So it used to be a function, but with the decorator, it's now a task class. And so it's nice and easy. Best practices, keep things thin, uh, keep the required uh, Components and, and, and things you're consuming from the Galaxy BI uh, container as small as possible, place things in the right place, and, and you're good to go. So, we have some initial success stories for tasks over the last couple of years here. Um, actually, these slides are all about the last year. Um, so, a couple of years ago, I added uh, Galaxy Markdown to PDF support, and it was essentially not usable. Uh, the PDF generation took too long, and the feature was quite unstable, even if you wanted to hack it up. It was quite difficult. And so, in the last couple of releases of Galaxy, we've added the short term storage component here. And what it is, is, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a component that's going to manage um, files that just exist for a short period of time um, and are being served back to the, to the, to the um, user. Um, and all of this is in, um, proxy through celery, the generation of them. Um, and this is going to get us around all sorts of hacks that you would have to traditionally do with Nginx, um, web server plugins, et cetera. Um, hopefully, in the future, admins will just need to know here's the endpoint that is you know, hosting these files, you know, point Nginx at that, do that for my things right at that endpoint, and then everything else can be, and the client can have you know, polling of that endpoint in a very consistent manner. Um, the, 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 the pydantic model that, that generates this, just taking a string token that sort of tells Galaxy where to write the file. And then here we got one of these tasks. And, then, and again, we've got the request, and then we've got the components that are being injected by Galaxy, and then we just do a line of work. And, and that's a very lightweight task. And now we've made PDFs much more stable to be generated in Galaxy. Um, on Sunday, I talked about all these APIs that I added for, for data set work, for exporting 
histories and invocations and libraries and collections in a consistent way. And all of this work is powered by Celery. It's powered by this task framework. Marius did a bunch of work on um, optimizing the upload of, of jobs. So the API tests, which aren't even supposed to be testing that work, went from two and a half hours to 50 minutes, which is work of, of keeping Celery, um, keeping the Galaxy process in, 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 in task. And, and, and doing the upload with, with Celery instead of with jobs. The work also explored composition of tasks uh, together in composite tasks in Celery. And so that's amazing work we'll continue to see evolve going forward. The batch operations that Gannon talked about, the long running ones were all implemented in Celery. Uh, future work, basically anything slow in the UI, we're going to Celerize. Um, thanks so much. Thank you. Next up is Milan. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about the Galaxy Vault, which is a way of securely storing sensitive information in Galaxy. So I think a lot of people were excited about this idea that you could um propagate user identity to uh, jobs or tools and maybe securely take actions on behalf of users i'm sorry to disappoint you this is not that talk <laughs> so this is going to be uh, a much more simple thing so it lowers the bar and uh, basically what what this does is now galaxy as you know increasingly interfaces with uh, external systems so it could be an S3 bucket or a Dropbox on behalf of the user, or perhaps uh, also cloud. So in all these quick cases, you need the Galaxy needs to be able to talk to these systems on behalf of the user and securely access the user's credentials. So for example, it's what I said it wasn't. Now, um, but of course, this is mainly concerned with storing these secrets in a secure way. So uh, uh, so really it's about uh, encrypting these secrets, uh, maybe having uh, an audit trail of access, uh, some centralized management capabilities, and the ability to revoke or rotate your encryption key. Uh, so this is really pretty hard to get right in Galaxy itself, and it incurs a lot of complexity. So ideally you want to delegate this to systems that already do this quite well. Um, so that is what the Galaxy Vault does. It's, in, it's a very simple programmatic interface for managing secrets with multiple cloudable backends. Uh, so this is the interface itself. Uh, so it just it just has three methods, and really it's just an abstraction over a key value store. So it can write secrets to a store and read secrets back, and it's really meant to be a building block for higher level services. Um, uh, so, so some of the high-level services that now do take advantage of this fault. We first will take a look at. We'll do, take a look at two examples. The first one will be uh, the user preferences. Now, so, as you may know, uh, in the Galaxy uh, user management, like the user preferences screen under Manage Information uh, in the UI, uh, there is a form that where you can gather user details. So this form is actually generated based on the YAML file that you uh, call the user preferences extra comp YAML uh, in your Galaxy uh, configuration. So we've now added the ability to store uh, specific fields in this form, like for example, maybe a secret for some sensitive password or something, and we can now route it to the vault so it's stored in an encrypted store. Another example of this is file sources. So file sources, as we know, is a way for Galaxy to access uh, remote storage like Dropbox or AWS buckets or something like that. And uh, in this case, again, Galaxy needs the user's credentials and we need a way to securely retrieve it and uh, handle that. So uh, we've now added 
the ability for the for file sources to directly read these credentials from the vault. So again, uh, it increases your uh, increases your ability to manage the secrets more more securely. Uh, so the vault itself is configured very simply. You just add uh, the an entry called vault config file and point to the config file. And the vault config file itself simply says what backend to use, and you know they're just credentials for connecting to that vault. Uh, so there are several supported backends. Uh, Custos is a managed service. So that uh, you can simply, so it's uh, it's run by the Custos project. It's an always on web service. You can just uh, straight away start using it after the registration process. So that's probably one of the easiest ways to get started. Uh, so we collaborated closely with the Custos project to uh, make this uh, happen. Uh, then uh, obviously, if you don't want to use that existing service and you want to run a vault yourself, you can use the HashiCorp vault. Uh, which is also what backs Custis as well. Uh, but of course, you do it yourself. Uh, and finally, uh, if you work with your requirements are rather modest and you just want to kind of have something you know, just to encrypt your secrets, you can just, there is a database backed uh, encryption management system as well. So that, uh, that simply stores it in a local table and you can do basic things like key rotation. Uh, I mean, not great, really, but better than not. Um, so yeah, so this is uh, uh, there's more documentation here. Uh, so basically, like, like, as I mentioned, we have two services that take advantage of this right now. So perhaps in the future, uh, more can do so. So consider deploying this and using this to encrypt your secrets on behalf of your users. So if there are any questions, uh, we have to take them. Do you have time for questions? Are there any questions? How hard is it to run that HashiCorp fault? Um, I mean, I guess it's not that hard, <laughs> but you still have to maintain the service, make sure it doesn't go down, uh, that kind of thing. So I guess comparatively speaking, a managed service is easier, but uh, the vault itself is just a single command to start it up and get it done. Is the vault accessible from Malta or is it just from Australia? No, not at the moment. So I think for that to happen, a lot more things have to happen on the way. Uh, we need to propagate identity, I think, and then have a way of the Galaxy API itself, I think, needs to be able to hand out some time limited API keys so that jobs can communicate with the Galaxy API and maybe access these secrets on behalf of the user. So, and if you take it another level further, the secrets you get should also be time limited and so on. So it's uh, more work to do there. So we, we have to kind of baby step our way there. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And next up, you join. All right, Galaxy's new database migration system. I will talk about what the database migration system does, what it is and what has changed, uh, what is new for both developers and admins, uh, a little bit of the internals, how stuff works, uh, and uh, just a glimpse into the troubleshooting and where to look for more information. So first of all, it's database schema migration. And schema migration is the management of incremental reversible changes to relational database schemas. So essentially it's like GitHub for databases, like Git for databases, a database version control. Uh, it is performed on a database whenever it is necessary to upgrade or downgrade the schema to a specific version. And how does it happen? Well, you execute a sequence of changes to the schema until the schema reaches a given state. So it goes from one to two, three to N or the other way around. And how we can do it? Well, uh, first of all, of course, we're all uh, SQL experts, so we can perform database surgery, uh, as quoted by uh, Dan and Baker. Uh, we can do it with our eyes closed. Uh, at the same time, we are programmers, which makes us lazy by definition. So we write scripts which do that for us. 
And this approach works absolutely beautiful for databases with two or three or four tables. What could possibly go wrong? Um, this is the Galaxy data model. Uh, it's a graph representation, fairly accurate. Uh, it contains 154 tables. They are presented as vertices, and the edges are explicitly defined relationships between these tables. Now, uh, the structure is not accurate. Of course, we have tables with zero relationships. We have tables with over 30 relationships. But this uh, representation is accurate in the size of the input. So it is dense, big, and scary. So one does not sit with my great manually the Galaxy data model. Uh, for that, we have migration tools that automate the process. And Galaxy has used SQL Alchemy Migrate up to now. It's a fine tool. It was a fine tool. However, it hasn't been maintained actively for at least 10 years. Uh, as a result, obviously, it is buggy and it is not going to work on the SQL Alchemy 2.0, which is a complete deal breaker for us. So we have moved to Alembic finally as of release 2205. So why Alembic and what is Alembic? It is a very actively maintained and developed project. Uh, it has been around for more than 10 years. It has 102 releases. The most recent release was just a couple of days ago, and I checked it the day before yesterday, so maybe they have a new release. I don't know. Uh, lots of issues, closed issues, well-addressed issues. It has excellent documentation, and the code is uh, very well-written, very coherent. It's a joy to read. Uh, furthermore, it is developed and maintained by the developer of SQL Alchemy, who you know to be very responsive and very easy and pleasant to deal with on GitHub. So, and in addition to that, it is the recommended migration tool for SQL Alchemy, has been recommended by the community for at least 10 years. So that's why Alembic. What's new for devs and admins? First of all, what's not new? And this is something I bet uh, many people didn't know. Uh, Galaxy's data model is actually two data models. It is the primary data model, the Galaxy Core Mate data model, and then a smaller install data model. So both of these models, they, they are not independent. They depend on each other. They are not separate applications. Uh, but they maybe persist in one combined database by default or two separate databases. Either way, and this is your install database connection uh, configuration setting, setting in Galaxy YAML. And of course, Galaxy has to accommodate both scenarios uh, in one code base. So how did this versioning of a two-in-one model work with SQL Alchemy Migrate? Well, uh, SQL Alchemy Migrate being a fine tool, it's quite uh, limited. So uh, we had one version language located in two separate directories. One directory for the Galaxy model contained all the migration logic plus all the revision scripts. The other directory for the install model contained exactly the same migration logic plus manually added symlinks to the relevant uh, revisions uh, in the Galaxy model. Uh, the upgrade process was relatively straightforward. You write a revision script, you place it in the versions directory, you create a symlink manually if targeting the install model, well, and then you run the upgrade script on one model or the other model. How does this work with Alembic? Well, first of all, Alembic is way more complicated. It um, it supports n in one data models via the concept is called branches. And branches essentially, uh, branches are used for many things in Alembic, but that includes versioning lineages that start at one common root and represent different parts of, uh, of one parent model. So this is our setup. We have one Alembic installation, no redundant code, no redundant logic, of course. Uh, and we use two branches. One is the branch for Galaxy, GXY. The other one is TSI, the branch for the toolshed install model, known as the install in the past. Uh, each branch has its own version history. It's represented by revision scripts, which are located in two separate uh, version directories. So the new upgrade process, step one, you create a revision script template. You do that by running a command. Uh, uh, the command, uh, this is an example of the command, it translates as create a new revision at the head of the Galaxy branch and call it create a uh, table pool. Uh, typical Unix user friendly uh, uh, syntax. Alembic will generate the revision script template for you and will place it into the appropriate directory. So, step two, you go into that appropriate directory, you open the script, and you fill in the body of two functions upgrade and downgrade. In step three, you run one of the two available migration scripts, uh, and they will run upgrades of both models simultaneously. That's it. 
Now, two available migration scripts, which one you choose. So there is manage DB and run a lambda. So manage DB or manage underscore DB on this stage. This used to be a very thin wrapper around SQL Alchemy Migrate. So what it did, it would uh, set up some configuration uh, values and directly pass control to SQL Alchemy Migrate. We don't have SQL Alchemy Migrate in code base anymore. So now manage DB is something completely different under the hood. It takes, uh, it provides a subset, a subset of basic SQL Alchemy Migrate uh, commands and translates them into input which understood, which uh, can be understood by Alembic. So it's an adapter of sorts. Uh, run Alembic.sh is just a thin wrapper around Alembic, the Alembic CLI run. So which one do you use? You can use either one. It really doesn't matter. If you need or prefer simplicity, go with Manage DB. Uh, if you prefer or if you need the full spectrum of Alembic CLI operations and options, which is quite impressive and very uh, handy at times, then use run Alembic.sh. Internals. So everything lives in lib galaxy model migration. This is all the code. It, 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 everything happens there. And the only two parts of it that are relevant or interesting to potentially interesting to a contributor are the versions directories, uh, the two uh, directories, one versions underscore GXY and other one underscore TSI. That's where all the revision scripts live. That's where you will go to uh, modify the body of the upgrade and downgrade functions. Uh, and the other one, if you are interested in uh, or need to figure out what's going on, uh, and look at the logic which is used by Galaxy every time on startup when Galaxy determines the state of the database or the two databases and determines what to do with that state, whether it can safely start up or, or, or it needs to fail or it needs to try to automatically upgrade. That happens in init.py. The logic is there, so if you want to uh, dig in and understand what exactly Galaxy does, that's where to look. You would need to look. And of course, the main issue here in this uh, update was migrating Galaxy migration system. So the goal was to provide a simple upgrade path for existing Galaxy's installations from 2201 to 2205. And again, the plan is very, very simple. Uh, the system should check if the database exists and if it's not empty, and if not, create and initialize it, then it's done. Uh, otherwise, determine whether the database is up to date. Uh, if not, check whether it can be upgraded automatically, upgrade or fail with informative message. Uh, that's it. It's very simple. But it comes with a lot of complexity. There are two models, which may be in two separate databases or in one combined database, which may have different versions, which may be upgraded in different order, which uh, may have been upgraded in a different way, and the upgrade, the, upgrade, the migration might have stopped in the middle. So uh, it goes on and on and on. So. Uh, to ensure a smooth transition across multiple configurations and database setup, each model runs through this. And we don't have enough time to do this justice. Essentially, this is the migration algorithm, which is it's a flow of logic, which is followed by Galaxy every time on each startup. And what it does, it tries to uh, follow every, within reason every possible uh, combination of configuration setup. Uh, in order to determine the path to the appropriate end state, which might be either a fail with some kind of message or uh, a dump rectangle, which means the galaxy continues to start up. And with great complexity comes great responsibility. You gotta test this. So there were two key test requirements. One, we needed to test the system under multiple configurations. So again, the plan is fairly straightforward. We, we know the set of input states of the world, uh, so to speak, uh, the database state, the configuration state, uh, and we know the desired output state, which we can match each of these input state, what we want the, the, the result to be as in the database being upgraded or the system exploding in our face with a uh, pleasant appropriate message. Um, so we would ideally, want to use the test first approach so we codify the inputs we match them to appropriate outputs uh we put this into a test function we run it it fails we implement the functionality we run it again it passes we far we're happy uh, the problem is the uh, there is no way to code no easy way to codify these 
multiple input states and multiple outputs, expected output states. So the second requirement is uh, each test case, each test case needs to run against SQL Lite. Well, that's easy. Uh, and PostgreSQL, but well, you think that's easy because we, we run tons of tests again PostgreSQL. The only problem is the, the, the each part. Uh, we have PostgreSQL uh, set up very conveniently for a test session, which includes tens, hundreds of tests, which we don't create and tear down a Postgres database for each test stage, which is not true though. So we set up a new testing infrastructure. Um, what it does is to address the first challenge of the input states and the output states. We have composable atomic metadata objects containing one table each. It's like bricks you can use to build bigger structures. So you take metadata objects we, uh, um, we would use to describe a certain makeup of a database. You put them together and then you condense them to the size of one uh, variable, which is uh, a PyTest fixture. And we give it to another PyTest fixture, which takes this database state and loads it, loads it up into a live database. And again, it's condensed into the size of one variable, one fixture, which is passed to the actual test function. So the test function eventually uh, essentially gets uh, a very simple format. Uh, you give it two simple arguments, which are in fact a database in uh, a composed state, and uh, a metadata, which is the output we expect from a database which comes in this state. And then the test function's body is going to be called a migration function or whatever function is called within the Galaxy code base on startup, and then verify that the resulting state of this database matches the expected uh, output state. And that's it, <laughs> nothing more. Um, the other test uh, requirement was addressed with new content, uh, context managers, which uh, ensure that Postgres uh, databases are created, populated, and then appropriate, uh, properly torn down on every single test case. So that works, it's all located in test unit data model. So troubleshooting and further information, troubleshooting just a glimpse. When things go bad, look at the database. First of all, you may have the migrated version table if you started with a previous version. It must contain version 180. If it's not that, that's the problem. Uh, next step, look at the alleged version table, which must be present. It will contain two values, two revision identifiers. And those two revision identifiers need to correspond to uh, the revision identifiers of the head revisions in the revision scripts in the uh, two version uh revision version directories version underscore gxy version underscore, underscore tsy uh if all looks fine look at the bodies of the upgrade downgrade function and if all fails see the next slide which is fantastic information and let's find it so we have a readme file uh in the code base it describes the migration system and a little bit uh, about how to troubleshoot we're still working on the troubleshooting section uh also i highly recommend the comments the comment blocks at the top of the scripts uh they include uh detailed instructions of how to use these scripts um, there is also the key pull request which contains detailed uh depth oriented descriptions of how the system works here are links to relevant Atlantic and SQL Alchemy uh, documentation. There are there is one very relevant tutorial coming up tomorrow contributing a new feature to Galaxy Core. And of course, the Galaxy back and working group is always happy to hear from you. If you run into problems, uh, we'll try to help. Thank you. Sorry I went over time. <laughs> And finally, we have um, Marius again, who's half Yep. So let's look at uh, uploads in Galaxy and specifically file uploads. Um, so there are a couple of upload options in Galaxy. You can upload files to disk. You can use the new core uh, remote file source with all these different uh, plugins, and you can even write more. 
Uh, we have tool uploads um, and data sources, so tools can also generate data. This is also kind of a method. Um, but right, sorry, we're talking about classrooms. Uh, how did Galaxy user uploads from this previously? Um, and sort of a historic uh, overview. So we could uh, transfer the whole uh, file in one go uh, using multi part form uploads. It's written to this, then we handed that off to the upload one tool, created a job. So um, both the upload and the handling uh, were slow. It's all handled in Python, and that's not where it excels. Uh, if the transfer got interrupted, the connection dropped, the galaxy was down. Well, have luck. Um, we improved on that using the Nginx uh, upload module, um, but that was kind of difficult to distribute. Uh, you have to compile it. Um, there's admin overhead involved. Um, and whenever you upgrade your distribution, you have to rebuild it. So, yeah. It's also kind of unmaintained, but it really works fine. Uh, it's still necessary to uh, transfer the entire file with this approach. There's no checksumming. Um, and uh, in response to that, and using difficulties to uploading large files, uh, we've developed the custom chunk uh, upload API. Uh, again, um, the downside is it's slow, it's handled in Python. Um, it requires Galaxy up and running at all times. And it had uh, limited resume, but it was possible. And um, the only client for, for that particular API was the Galaxy user interface. So I mean, BioLand where anything else was using this. And it created problems. So um, this is an issue we are opening in, in May 2020, and uh, problems because the user interface became unresponsive. And when you look at like what's taking time, what's that specific API? So you can see individual requests taking like up to 15 minutes, and um, it makes sense. Like I mean, slow user upload, um, trickling in slowly will will block. So that's not great. So what do we need? We need um, ideally an upload that is independent from Galaxy. And when I say this is true for most things we want to add, if it's external to Galaxy stuff. Uh, it should be a resumable performance. Um, we want to have uh, the, at least the possibility to do checksum uh, verification. Um, there should be a good out-of-the-box experience. It doesn't make it more complicated for admins to run Galaxy. Um, it should work with any proxy. Um, we, sort of recommend Nginx uh, because there's a lot of cool things uh, that, that help us, but it should still be possible to use Apache or you know, whatever else you want to use. Um, and it should be reliable and easy enough to uh, replace FTP on these guys with the board, which is what we had recommended since you know, a lot, very long time if you need to upload large files. Um, with the additional things, we are forced to replace all the FTP uploads. So what are our options? Um, well, I mean, I started looking into this, and the obvious things that you can search for Nginx upload modules to see if there's something better. There is. Um, so there's Nginx back, big upload. It's a Lua based script, um, can be installed on most distributions without recompiling the whole of uh, Nginx. It's a custom protocol, it's coupled to Nginx, so it doesn't really hit the all proxies check mark. Um, it requires an Nginx Lua module, which is easier to get than uh, the, the upload module. Um, but it also kind of looks unmaintained. Again, maybe it just works, but it doesn't lose confidence. Um, and then, well, I started working on this, and I mean, it can't be the right way. It's not, that's a problem other platforms have to have as well. Like, we are certainly not playing with any of the big files. Um, yeah, so with a bit more Googling, I found this uh, task um, protocol. So it's an open protocol for uh, resuming file uploads. That's a primary thing, protocol. But um, I mean, what was cool about this is an existing protocol, so I didn't have to come up with this. Uh, there are many server client implementations. It's robust, it's performant, uh, resumable, mostly external to Galaxy. I'll just come back to that briefly. And can optionally do checks on. So, um, we're not actually using checksums right now out of concern for performance and just getting some hands on experience first, but that's definitely a possibility that we may want to offer. Uh, so, how does how do we implement this? How does it work? Uh, so, the user um, starts with a, a upload request. There's, there's a fingerprint, um, that fingerprint identifies the file and the user. Um, and then, with that fingerprint, we contact the task server and ask, hey, do you know about this file? Um, well, no, sorry, I mean, we, yeah, we ask, do you know about this file slash is the upload complete? 
Um, if yes, we pass the inner frame on the galaxy and we're done. But I rolled up the field from the back. So usually it's not complete. So then we start uploading the chunks. On the first request, we pass through uh, the, the headers um, for Galaxy to verify that uh, the user is actually known. It's not just somebody uploading some crazy stuff. Um, or not necessarily user anonymous users also work. We just pass their headers through. Um, and then we go on our way, uh, the user uploads uh, data, and then finally we pass on the finger, fingerprint again. So the only thing at the end is like we, we have like a tiny request and then Galaxy does the same, um, but, but it uploads either through a tool or through a set of tabs. So actually during the upload process, you don't really need the Galaxy handler up, you don't need the Galaxy itself, just the thing. Uh, so how do I enable TOS on my Galaxy instance? Let me upgrade to this 2201 new. Um, um, so Galaxy comes with a middleware that acts as a TOS server. Um, obviously, that's not as performant as having external a TOS server back to the problem we had with the time of um, API. Uh, it doesn't do checksums uh, and restarts will obviously cause uploads. Um, but then for production instances, you want to run uh, TOS server uh, behind the proxy. So uh, we have experience now with TASD. There's also uh, Rust TAS that doing is looking actually even more interesting, but it wasn't out when um, we started doing it. Um, so we just have a proxy that takes up that uh, API route or sort of uh, middleware route um, that acting as the server. And instead, that's done being handled by the TAS server. Uh, Gerrit can start TASD um, or you can start it any way you want. Um, then the uploads will continue even if Galaxy is not up or is currently restarting, and well, we have the docs uh, up. Uh, so there are additional clients. So BioLand knows how to use the task uploads now with the TaskPy library. Uh, based on that, make go to GX upload script for command and uploads. Uh, there's RP um, that provides like a nice um, upload interface. Uh, the Galaxy front end uses the TaskJS client, so we do actually have to write all ourselves. And I mean, here's a list of official implementations, and the unofficial list is even longer. Um, so, yeah, uh, the history archive uploads will also start using TAS. Uh, we'll start doing TAS data in the full server, not to use TAS, so we can really get rid of the Nginx uh, module even for, for those cases. Um, and I have the NOA poster number, well, NOA number 35. So, if you have questions, I can, I can answer them there. So, yeah, thanks. For that.